good enough? Yeah, I think that'd be alright. So here's our campsite, just gravel and sand, got our picnic table. We moved the picnic table from there over to here. There's our electric, there's our water. So I figured she might be using the water. We was going to put the tent here, but we didn't want to, you know, walk around the mud. So we're going to put the tent over here because I don't think we're going to have a fire tonight. This is just a one-nighter because we're going over to the lighthouse which is just a mile or two over there and I'll get you some footage of that but we're taking a ghost tour right yes so if I got service I'll be live streaming it huh yep so and Bruno's back there trying to get out he's excited there he is hi Bruno <laughs> <laughs> he's happy he's got that smile on his face he loves adventures. Yes, All right, yes. so we're gonna set the tent up and go explore, huh? Yes. Yeah. Where you want to go to the beach? Yes. Okay. And then we need to go to the. We'll have to go early to the thing, so I can get drone footage of the. Yeah. The lighthouse. So. Okay. All right. Let's get set up. Okay, guys. So we made it to the beach. It's not far, is it? No. <laughs> There's the ocean out there. Yeah. Pretty windy. It's supposed to rain. Well, it rained on the way here. Every time we bring the tent, it rains. Yeah. <laughs> so I told her we'll try to trick Mother Nature next time. We won't bring the tent. We'll buy a tent once we get here. All right. But this is pretty cool. So this is pretty cool. We're actually on a dune. Cool. Okay guys, we're at the lighthouse, so we're getting ready to go in. Well, we're actually in the house part, which is now a museum, but we're heading in now, and then we'll go to the lighthouse, and we're going to take our tour. We're at the lighthouse. This is like the main event, I assume, for most of you, right? This is why you're all here tonight. Well, if I wanted to tell you every single ghost story about our lighthouse, we'd be here all night. No one would have time to do anything else. So I'm going to try and narrow it down to the greatest hits. Can I get a show of hands? Who here has seen Ghost Hunters? There's always a few of you. Now keep your hands up if you've seen the one where they've come here. For those of you who have, feel free to just shout it out. What is one thing you remember from that episode? Them seeing the things looking over the um, oh, trail in there? I yeah. Didn't see that. Yes. Thank you very much. That is the answer I always get, so thank you for knowing your lines. Yeah. Now, uh, for those of you who are not aware of what we're talking about, in about 2005 or 6, somewhere around then, the ghost hunters came to our lighthouse for the very first time. They put a camera inside facing up the stairs, and they caught on video the shadowy outline of a man leaning over the railing and looking down at them. Now, they're braver than I am, and they decided to give chase. They climbed up the lighthouse, they chased after it, and that figure, that shadow, they see it running up the stairs ahead of them, about a flight or so ahead, and they get to the very top, and they're the first to set off the motion-sensitive light that we keep on the top landing of the lighthouse, which of course means that there's nothing visible ahead of them, right? Now, uh, 
of course they know that they saw something and they want to make sure that there's nothing weird going on around them. So the only sign of any activity they can find is a swinging padlock on one of the, uh, one of the doors. Now whether you know it or not, that is why you're all here this evening, because if we had not had that incident, we probably wouldn't have ghost tours and I would be out of a job. Now this figure, this shadow figure as we call it, it is very frequently seen around here. It usually does the same things, so if you want to see it tonight, I recommend as you are climbing the lighthouse, watch the landings ahead of you, occasionally peek up through the stairwell, Watch below you as you're going back down. As you're walking around this evening, watch those windows, watch that top landing. All of these are places where we have frequently seen this figure. About month two into working here, I was closing up this building for the very first time. I was walking down the stairs and I know there's no one behind me. I searched, right? I made sure there was no one up there as I'm going down. And about halfway down, I start to hear footsteps behind me. Now this building is super echoey. So I thought, you know what? It's my own echo. It's nothing to worry about. But still I was freaked out because this was pitch black inside. And just being in that kind of environment tends to be kind of scary. So I say to myself, you know what? I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna take a break, catch my breath before I continue and I'll prove that nothing's going on. So I stop, and when I do, the footsteps keep going, and they only get closer. And that's when I make the educated decision to run down the last two flights of stairs. And uh, this is my request for all of you tonight. Don't do that. It, it's not a good move. It's really dark, the stairs are dark too, so it's just, it's a, it's a tripping hazard waiting to happen. One of the rules that I did not mention, this is a personal rule on my tour, there is no falling allowed. Don't <laughs> do it. Um, if you do find that you are being chased down the lighthouse by a shadowy specter, calmly and quietly exit the building. Now with that, I'm gonna move us on to our next spot, which will luckily be indoors. So we're gonna go this way. Now you might have noticed that that's not what our lighthouse looks like, and that's because this was the first lighthouse here in town. Uh, it was just across the street of what is now a yacht club. Uh, there's a little plaque down there across the street, by the way, if uh, you want to see that later. Um, now, we traced this building back to about 1586. That's when Sir Francis Drake came to our city, made a map of everything he saw, and on that map was a small wooden watch tower down on the beach. So, we only have record of that because of that map, and that map is conveniently just on the floor right there. <laughs> and feel free to walk all over it, by the way, because Sir Francis Drake burnt our city to the ground. <laughs> now, luckily, that building was remade and over the years upgraded a small coquina tower, and that's a mixture of like shell and sands that we use a lot here in town, which is luckily less flammable. And it stood like that for over a hundred years until 1820 when they added a few extra feet uh, and they put a lens in the top, and that became Florida's first lighthouse. Now, we go through a few different lightkeepers at this time. Uh, before we get to Joseph Andrew. And Joseph Andrew, he had a lot to do as light keeper. See, he had to bring oil up to the light. He had to keep a lookout for any ships that might be destroyed at sea. He needed to save the people from those ships if that came to it. Um, but he also had like, a lot of general maintenance to do. He had to mow the lawn. He had to keep garden running. Uh, one of the other things he had to do was paint this entire lighthouse. Now what he would do, twice a year, every year, was build scaffold it all by himself to the very top, and he would paint the entire thing with a six-inch brush. A lot of work. 
And after he had been here four years, uh, the year was 1859, not too long before the Civil War started, uh, he was once again painting the White House. He was all the way at the top. He just put down the first few strokes of paint. And as the scaffolding that he had made collapses beneath him. I'm sorry, man. Would you mind just... I'm fine. Oh, thank you. Sorry, I didn't know that's what you were doing. I appreciate it, though. So, he built his scaffolding. He's all the way at the top. And it gives way beneath his feet. He has no way to save himself. And he falls from the very top up here. First, he lands on the oil house roof beneath the tower. He bounces off of that and he cracks his neck on the wall that surrounds the building. And that is a lot of detail. It's a lot of very grisly detail. How do we know all of that? Well, that is exactly the way it was reported in the newspaper's obituary section. Yeah, which says a couple things to me. Number one, that obituaries used to have a much different vibe. Now, the other thing it says is that someone had to have been here to see it happen. But at the time, this island was pretty much abandoned. The only ones who would have lived here to see it would have been his wife, Maria, or any of their kids. And now, Maria Andrew is in a very difficult spot. Not only has she, of course, lost her husband, but she's now the sole breadwinner in a family that still includes several very young children. New Year's 1859, which doesn't leave her a lot of options. Now, local legend says the night of her husband's death, she climbs to the top of the lighthouse and in desperation and in anguish, she calls out into the wind, what shall I do? She hears the voice of her husband reply, tends the light. So, whether or not she did hear that voice, that is exactly what she does. Because Maria was the first female lightkeeper here in our town, and the Coast Guard actually recognizes her now as the first Hispanic woman in charge of the naval station here in America. So we're all very proud of Maria. And she's lightkeeper up until the Civil War starts a few years later. Now, when the war starts, Maria knows that her lighthouse will be in danger. See, lighthouses are not light during war. They're destroyed because they light up their own ships and enemy ships, so no one wants them around. Now, to make sure it wasn't a target, she took the lens from the very top, and with the help of uh, only the mayor of St. Augustine, they buried it in a secret location. And due to their efforts, both the lens and the tower survived the war. Now, that's some great thinking on her part, but at the end of the day, a lighthouse without a light does not need a light keeper. And so she's basically pushed herself out of a job. We don't know where she goes after this. Uh, we think maybe north to Georgia, but all records of her were lost. So we're just not certain what happens to her. What we do know is that she never returns to her lighthouse. Not while she's alive anymore. Because although the shadow figure uh, that I mentioned earlier is the most famous spirit here, Maria is by far the most frequently seen. Now, we get reports of the same woman wandering property and the nearby areas, always described the exact same way. Long dark hair and a flowing white dress. We get reports of this person across the street uh, by the side of the original lighthouse, pacing back and forth down by the docks, we get reports of her on top of our current lighthouse. In fact, neighbors call in sometimes. They say, all worry, there's someone that the dark the moon left on top of the tower. Now don't worry, we've never done this. We've never lost anyone, I promise. Uh, but every time we get this call, my boss has to come out and check. Every time he does, he climbs to the top of the tower, he looks around, and the only thing he ever reports is the smell of orange blossoms on the wind. So we believe that this figure is Maria. Now, my favorite place we see her, though, is over in the nature trails. As people walk into the gift shop in the middle of the day, and they'll be coming back from the woods, and they say, I was walking around in the trails, and I got lost. 
Now, I wandered for a while, and then one of your reenactors came and helped me out. And she was so nice, and she knew so much about the lighthouse, even the original lighthouse. Stuff that wasn't written down anywhere in the museum. And she had this lovely white dress. And of course, we don't know how to tell them that we have never had reenactors. So, we just smile, we nod, and say, that's Maria, she's our favorite employee, and we send them on the way. So, I recommend you guys check out the woods later. Uh, if you see this figure in a long white dress, come let us know. It's either Maria or a crazy person who hops the fence. Uh, but uh, on a more serious note, we do actually get a lot of reports back there. Uh, just last night, we had people hearing these mysterious voices uh, back on the trail. So, we definitely recommend it. Um, and with that, I'm going to move this on to our next spot. Uh, now, before we get started, I just want to do a quick couple of warnings about this room. Uh, first of all, uh, hands up again if you have a meter. Now, uh, if you have a meter, there is something in the room that's going to set off this meter, and it is the doorway directly in front of me. Now, that is not the doorway to the other side, it's just <laughs> a very scary, spooky electrical closet. And so your meter will go off. Uh, there's actually just like a lot of electronics around this room. So in general, I like to say if you're in this room and your meter's going off, take it with a grain of salt. Anywhere else in the house and you will be fine. Now, behind me, I already mentioned the stairs here. So you are free to go down later. Uh, like you guys said, this is the main entrance to the basement. I just ask that if you do bring a light with you, you might be able to tell. It's really dark down there. And at the bottom, we have these raised wooden platforms that are super uneven. Now, in the daytime, that's our shipwreck exhibit, and those floors are meant to be like the shifting sands of a sandbar. But the people who planned that exhibit did not plan for night tours. So, they're major tripping hazards. Like I said, falling is not allowed on my tour. Don't do it. <laughs> So, you've all been warned with that, and this last warning is not something I have to tell you all, it's just me being a nice guy. Uh, downstairs, in Pete's room, which is going to be on the other end of the basement, there is a mannequin. <laughs> like I said, they didn't plan for night tours. Uh, so, if you... Last one. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, so if you see this figure waiting for you in the darkness, Make sure it's not meant to be there before you run screaming out of the building. Uh, oh, another quick note. Um, there is going to be like a wooden cutout of a British soldier up against one of the walls, too. Um, now, with that, we can actually get started. So, there is another spot in the basement I want to tell you all about. It's, uh, it's really neat. We've had a lot of activity down there. It is this back corner just downstairs. Now, there's this, like, it, I guess, in a wall that you can fully submerge yourself behind. Once again, we ask you guys don't scare each other, but do feel free to check out that corner if you like. Uh, because, like I said, we have a lot of activity. There's a whole creepy atmosphere around it. And we're not super creative here, so we call it Creepy Corner. <laughs> now, uh, Creepy Corner, it's had a few major incidents go down there. Um, we used to leave tours downstairs into the basement, and every now and then, for some reason, always a child would shush the corner as if there was something very loud going on that only that child could hear. Now, there were also these mysterious boot prints that once appeared in the concrete. And I don't mean like boot prints of dirt, I mean they were pressed into the concrete which is a big deal, of course, because the concrete is original. See, this house was made in 1876, and that concrete has not been touched since 1876. So one day we all come in, and it looks like it's someone stepped in wet cement. And of course, that's going to raise some red flags, right? But before we could even address that, and our maintenance guys could fix it, they come in one day, and it's just as strange as they appear, they were gone. So, 
like I said, weird stuff happens down there, but the strangest by far is the figure that people see. It's always described the same way. A tall man with a blue suit and a flat blue cap. Now this happens to match the description of our keeper's uniform. Now, I've been bringing them up more lately because we've had a few more sightings. Uh, in fact, not too long ago on one of these tours, uh, there were a couple of young men, about eight or nine years old, standing to my left on the other side of this railing. And they pulled me aside later when I was moving us to the next spot, and they said, Jackson, when you were talking about the man that stands in the corner, we looked downstairs, and there was a man standing in the corner. So I'm going to request of all of you guys, if you see something going on behind me, wait till I'm gone to let me know. I don't want to know about it. Uh, in fact, uh, just on Friday night, I, uh, uh, someone listened to my advice very faithfully. And uh, as I'm moving us to our next spot, this very frantic little girl pulls me aside and says, she was looking downstairs while I was talking, and there was a bright red face looking back at her from the basement. So, like I said, don't tell me. Tell me after the tour. So, uh, now with that, there's a few other spots in the house that I recommend you guys check out. Um, the most notable is probably across the hall, the other half of this floor. It's made to look like a Victorian era house, like it might have looked when it was made. And there's a lot of antique stuff in there. Um, and the strangest is an antique rocking chair. See, there was an incident where on a private tour of one guest, she thought if she sat down in the rocking chair, she could make contact with the first light keeper to live in the house. His name was Major William Harn, and she got special permission. Now, before any of you guys ask, no, you are not allowed to sit in the rocking chair. But she sits down, she says, well, she says something and makes a mistake. Instead of Major William Harn, she says, Captain Harn, are you here? And Major Harn had worked very hard for his title, and he didn't like when people forgot it. So, this rocking chair she's sitting in, it starts moving back and forth and shaking back and forth until she's practically thrown from it. And the tour guy that's with her, she thinks that this is some sort of a goof. She thinks that it's a prank, she's being messed with. But, you know, she wants to keep it light, she doesn't want any awkwardness going on. So she plays along and looks at the chair, still moving back and forth. And she thinks, you know, it's going to slow down because she just stood up from the chair. So, playing along, she says, well, Major Harm, if you're still here, stop the chair. Now, like I said, she thought it was going to slow down as if someone had just stood up from it, right? Well, as soon as she says, stop the chair, it stops. Dead in its tracks. And with that, they decided to leave the house. Now, I have had a few experiences in this house myself. Um, definitely the weirdest one, it kept happening a lot uh, for some reason, I don't know why. When I was uh, closing the house on multiple occasions throughout the week, I have to close this house at the end of our daytime hours. I'll lock all the doors, I'll go through the whole place and make sure there's no one in here. And when I first started for a few months, about half the time I did this, I would always hear whistling coming from the same room on the other side to the right. Now, I don't know who that might be. Uh, there have been other various musical reports uh, throughout our history here. Lots of people will hear singing, humming, that kind of thing. So I think it might be those same spirits messing with me. Now, with that, I'm going to move us on to our next spot. Is everyone okay going to the very next floor? Earlier I was telling you all about the original lighthouse, right? As you may have noticed, it's not there anymore. That's because it was down on the beach and it stood there for over 300 years. So what that means is we had about 300 years of waves crashing against the shore, and that shoreline got closer and closer to the lighthouse. 
And of course, people realized that it would eventually fall, which it did. Uh, but before it did, Congress set aside some money to build a brand new one. In 1871, construction started just outside, and it was led by a man uh, by the name of Hezekiah Pitty. Now, Mr. Pitty, he, he came down here and moved onto this island with his family, his wife and four kids. He had a son and three daughters, but today we're going to talk about the three daughters. Their names were Mary, Eliza, and Carrie. They ranged in ages from 4 to 14. And, well, I want you all to put yourself in their place for a minute. Imagine that you are a child of about that age, and your parents move you onto an abandoned island. Now, the only things you have to do to fulfill your day are schoolwork and chores. Aside from that, you love to make your own fun, right? Sounds kind of boring, though. 1871, there's not a lot going on. Now, the girls did see something that they thought they could entertain themselves with, that they would make their own personal playground, and this was, of course, the active construction site. Now, any parents in the room, you might have just had sirens going off in your head, thinking about kids playing on a construction site, which is never a good idea. So, Mr. Pitty sat down with his kids, he told them, go anywhere on the island, play wherever you want, do not play on the construction site. Now, of course, what happens when you tell a group of children not to do something? Maybe. That is right. They, of course, go to play on the White House whenever they can get away with it. But they have a favorite toy. See, there is an iron rail car. It was made to move bricks down from the docks where all the building materials would come in, all the way up to the lighthouse, and to the girls. It kind of looks like their own personal roller coaster. So they would hop on in at the top when they saw it wasn't going to be used. They'd push off and go sailing down the track. Right when they got to the bottom, they'd hop out and push it right back up and go again. Now, as they got to the bottom, they'd throw the brake on first. Now, they did this a lot, up until 1873, July. They see that the car is not in use. On this day, they bring a friend with them. We don't know much about the friend. We know she was an African-American girl. We believe she was the child of a construction worker or maybe a maid who lived on the grounds. Sadly, there were no other records of her pet. So the four girls hop in the car. They push off and go sailing down the track, and right when they get towards the dock, where they normally throw the brake on, they figure out that the brake was broken. And that is why the car was not in use that day. So they go down the track, they go off the dock, and that iron rail cart they're in flips over and it pins them underwater. Mm -hmm. So there's a man nearby named Dan Sessions, who was a construction worker, and he sees the whole thing happen. He jumps in the water, he swims as fast as he can, he uses all of his strength, all of his might to try and lift up that iron rail cart and save the girls. But it's just not enough, and he takes just a little too long. He can only save Carrie, who was the youngest. So July of 1873, four girls go into the water, and only one comes out. Now that is easily the most tragic story I have told you all night. And you might expect that that energy would follow to how we feel these spirits here today. But the opposite is true. The girls here are very playful. Uh, they like to play pranks, for example. Now, you may have noticed I've been moving around a little bit here. This isn't just so I can talk to all of you. Uh, but it's also because their favorite targets are people who are sitting or standing still with their feet close together. So you can both untie shoelaces and then tie the two shoes together. So that if you're not paying attention, if you stand up, you take a step, you fall flat on your face. We even had someone once who was standing inside the lighthouse, the very bottom, one foot on that bottom step. And she was being calm, 
quiet, listening to her tour guide, which she was really excited to find. And she decides to look down at her shoes, and they have been tied to the railing of the staircase. And she suddenly decides that she no longer wants to climb, and she leaves the property immediately. <laughs> now, uh, one of the other things that they like to play with are these glow sticks. So, I ask you guys, don't spin these around, don't throw them right? They can make a mess, they're a distraction, we just don't like it. And we've had this rule for a while. So when we had a private tour of Girl Scouts a few years ago, we told them this rule. So what I'm saying is we told a group of 20 or so small children not to do something. And of course all night, this is all the tour guide is seeing. It's just glow sticks being played with nonstop. And she's just trying to power through. She just wants to get through the day and go home. So she's giving her tour, she's not paying it any mind. And so they get up to this room here, and then finally she sees a glow stick pop off and go flying to the end of the room. She just kind of sighs to herself, picks it up, gets it back, keeps giving her tour, and just a couple minutes later, the same glow stick pops off, flies to the end of the room. And at this point, she has had enough. So she picks it up, she gives it back, and she's about to lay down the law on this poor girl whose arms shoot up in fear. She says, I have not touched my glow stick all night. And of course, no one believes her. So she says, I'll prove it. She puts it back around her neck. She stands in the middle of the room, arms out to her side. And everyone sits in a circle around her. And they all watch for about 10 minutes. For a while, nothing happens. And right when they're about ready to give up and go home, they see as it lifts up on its own, pops off and flies to the end of the room. With that, everyone stands up and flies out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> so keep your eye on your glow sticks. They like to misbehave. Um, and see. Oh yeah, because I mentioned it earlier. You know how I mentioned the singing and humming that people hear all over the grounds? Mm -hmm. Well, we got one guess of who that might be. I of course, believe that that is the girls. So I think that might be who was whistling at me when I started. Um, they like to mess with people. Uh, they don't really like the tour guides, so I think that might be where that whistling's coming from. Uh, so, that's Mary, Eliza, and the third we've taken to calling Ellie. Uh, okay guys, so Monkey went up the lighthouse by herself. I'm watching Bruno, then I'm going to go up because they wouldn't let Bruno up the stairs in the lighthouse. I don't know why he was up there before, but maybe because it's dark. I don't know. But she's up there right now. So I let her go first. And then I'll take you guys up if she gets back in time because, um, Uh, we're not allowed up there after 9.05. They're going to start locking up because the tour is over at 9.30. So, hopefully I can get in there and film some for you out of the top of there after dark. This is not so much as a ghost uh, a ghost thing, but it is uh, some interesting stories I wanted you to hear that the tour guide was telling us. So, anyway, I'll be back with you guys in a minute. Okay, guys, we're going up the stairs now.
I'm not gonna leave me on the whole way. So, all right, I'll kick you back on when we get up to the top. We still got all this way to go. All right, hang tight. Here we are up the top. Got you off night vision for now. Sorry about the wind. Ooh, sorry about that. There's the bench we were sitting on down there. Okay guys, we're going down to the basement. This is come down out of the lighthouse. That's weird. Okay. I gotta shine the light back there for her. I got a light on my cap. That's very uneven there. Can you turn this back on for me? The light keeper's house. He didn't actually live in the lighthouse. He lived here. I'm gonna shut my headlamp off. Is there any steps through here? No. These are the two chairs they encourage you to sit in. There's a mannequin back there. Yeah, he said there was a mannequin back here. Uh -huh. These are the chairs that, <laughs> that Pete, oh. the clean Pete. There, okay, I just went out of focus. This thing has not been focusing right all night. <clears throat> They can't really do any ghost stuff, you know, because there's still a bunch of people outside and they were loud. Oh, they were horrible. God. Did you hear that kid screaming when he was in the lighthouse? Yeah. He was clear outside. I know. Horrible. I mean, people can tell you. Well, it's supposed to be an adult yeah. tour anyway. Right. And then... I'm not going to try to walk over there because my footing's not that great from that. Where is the corner where the girls are? Is it in here or is it the other room? I don't know. We need if the girls are coming out. I would bring them. Bruno's not. Look, there's no way in there. There's no way in this room. More ships. Look, there's no way in this room. What is that? Ships. Go me. Wow. There's more here. There ain't no way to get in there. 
that word. Hmm. Hello? Any ghosts? Anybody want to come and play? Heading back up. We're about to call this tour done. Oh, thanks. So. You don't want to try to take him to the house. Okay. He's fighting her. He don't want to go. Wanna go in? He usually wants to go up the steps and go in. He's like not wanting. No. No. All right. Okay. You don't We're have gonna to. We're gonna go. We're gonna go. Had enough? Yeah. He wants out of here. <laughs> you don't like it. Did you see something? Huh? Yeah, he, he's never not wanted to go explore a room. Mm -mm. Yeah, to fight him the whole way down there. Yeah. Huh. Weird. Well, well, let me go by you or something. Go in front of it so I don't get hurt. Come on. I don't want to run. Oh, my God. He won't. Just go. Uh -huh. There he goes. He's a baby. Bye, baby possum.